Hello everyone and Happy New Year to you all. Welcome to episode 7 of Reservoir Red Dogs. I'm Matt Ford and on a recent poll I was named the 91st most influential person on the left. I'm pretty sure they mean politically. I'm sandwiched somewhere between Stormzy and Jeremy Corbyn, which ironically is not only an indication of my growing political stature, throwing a Vix inhaler, and it's also my special naughty thought. <laughs> what more? <laughs> hey, I want to make it clear, Paul McGregor wrote the introduction to this episode. God, what point font is this in, by the way? <laughs> Crikey, mate. That's the thing to worry about, yeah. Oh, it's like an optician's in here. <coughs> right, hold on. <laughs> also, hey, Jude is... Oh! <laughs> Come on, say, you've got to say it. I have to say your nonsense. Also, hey, Jude is the worst song ever written apart from Imagine. I don't believe that. <laughs> but Paul McGregor wrote today's intro. Yeah. Yeah, well, I had to get that out. <laughs> and I'm Paul McGregor. I was once voted the third coolest footballer in the, w- in the world by Shoot magazine. In second place was Paolo Maldini, and obviously the top of the pile was uh, Daniel. Oh, check me out. I've pressed play on a record in front of 10 people a couple of times in London. Diccio. To this day, I'm totally cool about it, Matt. <laughs> uh, welcome to the podcast, everyone. Happy New Year to you all. <laughs> Paul, what have you done? Well, uh, I was I was just a little bored of yours, so thank That's you for fine. letting me write that. It was a pleasure. Um, if you need a writer for your new show, I'm you know I'm available. But thank you very much. No problem. That was great. Yeah. Uh, happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you. Did you have a good Christmas? It was all right. Yeah. The good New Year. Um, I don't really go in for it, to be honest. It's, it was a few beers around a friend's house. That was it. So I'm not trying to be a killjoy. Christmas was all right. Yeah, it was Christmas. I sat eating chocolate and cheese like everyone does now regular listeners to the show will know that you were deeply ill before christmas we're all very me and your mother were worried sick (laughs) when did you shake it off and are you okay now it uh, swear to god it took me about four weeks like you know everyone's had it it was it was so bad couldn't pick my head off the pillow for five days um and i'm ever so glad that i gave it to bert's you, you did, you made Apparently, him. Apparently, yeah. Johnny said that. You gave it to Johnny Owen as well. Did I? Yeah, you gave it to Get everyone in. apart from me. Hi, Johnny, by the way. Hey, doing, Mark? You all right? I'm good, mate. I didn't know you. I gave it to you. We should say at the tar- start of the show as well that it was a very special Christmas for our producer, Johnny Owen, who got engaged. Yeah, on Christmas congratulations. Day to our vicar. <laughs> congratulations, Johnny. Engaged to a Notts County fan. How do we feel about that, boys? I'm fine with it. How do you feel? Yeah, I'm all right. Yeah, it's good. She said yes, that's the main thing. Yeah. It is. And how did you propose? I put it where um, the tea bags are. She makes the morning tea, I make the last cup of tea at the night, and in the morning I put them where the tea bags were, and there was a ring. So when she went down to make tea, there was a ring there. Lovely. You've got, nice. you got a tea rotor in your house. I bet you wish we were making coffee now. Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to introduce the guest or what? We are, we are. I was just getting the, getting the admin out of the way. Our guest today is a true Forest legend. He scored the winning goal in the 1919 League Cup <laughs> final. He is Nigel Jensen. Well, suddenly, Clough's way up forward now. And Jensen with a chance for Forest. He's done it. Forest have snatched the lead. With Nigel Jensen, the manager, quite unmoved. The goalkeeper quite perplexed. And the fans absolutely... Nigel, good morning. Well, good morning, morning and welcome Gemma. to the show. Thank you very much. We are delighted to have you here. Delighted uh, to be here. It's always a treat when, when we get people on here that, that we remember watching play. And I remember watching you for many years at Forest. I remember meeting you at a, um, at, you know those Forest Junior Reds Open days that used to do in the Executive Stand car park? Oh yeah, there's a, Mick Rayner used to take us there, didn't he? I think it was. <laughs> yeah. awesome. Didn't you enjoy it? Yeah, of course you did, yeah. <laughs> Especially after a night out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it must have been slightly monotonous for you, just sat there behind a the desk signing autographs all day. No, it was it was delightful to do that, especially the kids coming up and uh, wanting pictures taken. And it's part of possibly your job, isn't it? You know, without those people coming to see you, you're what are you? You know, you're, you're nothing, aren't you, really? And that is the party tagline. <laughs> <laughs> sat there with a hangover <laughs> queue of yeah. Is that the way to get people. through it? That's the way to get through it. Is to do it. Have a big night the night before, and then you can just sort of drift The Black through Orchid it. Pill, it was called. <laughs> <laughs> what, the one near the showcase? Yeah. Oh. By the way, the worst rebranding of all time. ISIS, it called itself. Oh, goodness me. Couldn't have gone worse, could it? <laughs> then it was what? Senoritas after that one, too. It was, yeah. Not that I go. Yeah, I think it's Boko Haram now. They've really, they've really uh, <laughs> chosen the names very badly over the years <laughs> on the uh, late and late industry and stuff. <laughs> But was that the main haunt then, the Black Hole <laughs> Yeah, the only, only Thursday, Saturday, Monday nights, that was all, though. Yeah. <laughs> was it? I mean, I, it's becoming a running theme on this show, asking what it was like to play for Forest in terms of the social side of it. 
Was it still a, a hard drinking culture when you were there? Um, yeah, obviously planes on a Saturday. It wasn't as if you had to obviously drink water for the rest of the night and be in first thing in the morning. We never we never trained Sunday morning. Well, we didn't train Monday either, I don't think. <laughs> but um, no, as soon as we finished the game, we had a, a couple of pints probably in the Jubilee Club at the time. And then Perfect. it was a case of getting changed and meeting the TBI, yeah. uh, Avery. Sam Faze. Sam Faze. Because <laughs> obviously he's damn well. And then straight to <clears throat> the Orchid, where we got, obviously, VIP um, looked after. And straight to the front of the queue, because it was miles of queue. It was yeah, miles. It was massive, wasn't it? And uh, straight in there, up, upstairs, and that was it till three in the morning, probably. Oh, the good old days. I was so jealous of... Firstly, people who got to be footballers at all, but... I think that was probably the best era to be a footballer. It was a great era. I mean, people talk about the football nowadays. It's a lot faster and um, there's finally two athletes out there rather than people playing with about three or four pounds overweight. Um, why did you great. look at Matthew when you said that? <laughs> why, why are you breathing in now? Because Everyone I'm does that, don't you? self <laughs> No, you look really good in that red jumper. But you're, um, I've put on weight over the years. You've probably lost it. Exactly. <laughs> I, I look around at um, other footballers that um, you know were, were nice and thin beforehand and used to give me stick for being stocky, should I say. And I look now to people like David Hurst, who's well overweight, and uh, I feel quite good about myself, to be honest. So, uh... <laughs> but did you, um, did you back then, you got a bit of stick for your weight. You were never ludicrously overweight. Was it just puppy fat or was that a sort of uh, lifestyle issue? I actually loved it. But you know when they used to give me steak, it used to not spur me on even more. To, and um, you know, obviously everyone used to shout the, the I was a fat such and such a person. Um, <laughs> but it did. I used to roll my tummy and you know rub me. And, uh, it was great. I loved it. I can remember one game especially. Um, I think I was playing for Shrewsbury against Oxford. And... Uh, we won one nil and I scored, and it must have took me ten minutes to walk back from the you know to the halfway line. I just loved it, uh, but I had to get police escort out of the ground at the end of it though. But did managers ever say to you? Did Cluffy ever say you got a bit of weight on you, Nige? Or were they not that bothered? Well, most clubs you you got weighed. And Nottingham Forest, Liam did it, and we found a way of cheating by <laughs> leaning on the table, leaning something like that, or taking one leg off or one leg off. Um, but the worst ones at Sheffield Wednesday because we had a culture in there that it was a good banter. But we used to have bacon, sausage, and eggs every morning. So Trevor decided to wear us every Monday and Friday, and it was really for three people because it was myself, David Hurst, and and someone else that the ones that put Chris Woods, I think it was, who put weight on. The rest were, were fine about it. But I used to, yeah. when could you enjoy yourself? You couldn't enjoy yourself during the week because you got weighed on Friday. In the weekend, you're panicking for Monday morning. It was horrible. <laughs> but I mean, I suppose back then it wasn't. The demands on footballers now have probably transformed even in the short time since you stopped playing. Back then, you could still sort of get away with it, could you, without people being outraged? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you carry one or two or three pounds, but um, I don't think you could do much more than that, I don't think. But nowadays, it's a business, isn't it? It's more than a sport. You know, you're getting paid that much more money now that, you know, like say, the body fat was, when I was playing, I, was, I think the best I was on was about 11%. Nowadays, you've got to be under about five or six, I think. So um, I won't be able to play now. <laughs> what do you reckon I'm on? <laughs> I think if you reach above certain, I think it's 30%, percent you become obese. <laughs> you really, really delivered that. No, I didn't say that's you. I'm just saying that's... It was Venom behind that, wasn't it? Yeah, real work behind the jab. <laughs> I won't mind cuddling up to you in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> be right. I'd be more than happy with that now. Oh, don't get him started. Good God. Now, we've had a lot of emails, a lot of Forest fans very excited that you're on. Um, you can email us about uh, anything really Forest-related, rrd1865 at outlook.com. We've got, we've got loads of emails for you here, Nigel, before we uh, crack on with asking you about your career. Um, some lovely ones, people's memories of you. Um, That's nice. Ed Sherborne, we've picked out a couple here. Ed Sherborne says, A lot of people credit Mark Robbins with saving Fergie's job at United when he scored the winner against Forest in the FA Cup at the City Ground. However... Jemmo could and should cost him his job when he scored a perfectly good equal, equaliser which was wrongly ruled out. Jemmo's sliding door moment, football history could have been changed. Yeah, I look back at that game and um, I think I came out in the paper, I think the week before, typical me, <laughs> I'd love to get Ferguson the sack. <laughs> yes! <laughs> uh, but um, obviously people know that I turned Manchester United down to come here. Uh, right. Obviously I met uh, Alex Ferguson. That game, I scored a perfectly good... Uh, I think it was a header, I think, and got disallowed. And I, to this day, I don't know why. Um, but, hey, 
things might have been different at Manchester United. So Ferguson was was very keen on you, wasn't he? He'd, he'd offered a hundred grand. <clears throat> he'd actually invited you for a two day training stint, but you didn't go back after the first day. Is that right? It, it was two hundred fifty grand, actually, not hundred grand. Is that right? Yeah. Um, but um, yes, obviously they watched me. Uh, obviously, there's quite a lot of clubs watching me, but. Um, I think I've made it known that obviously Brian Clough was uh, the person I'd like to have gone there. Um, typical gaffer. I think he got his greengrocer to go and watch me at Mansfield. Um, but um, yeah, it was agreed with the two clubs that um, you know Manchester United wanted me. Uh, I had to go for two days. It was all agreed. So I went first day, uh, met Ferguson, played in a practice game with the likes of you know Brian Robson, Norman Whiteside, etc., etc. And I came back. Uh, Obviously, the phone rang that night, and um, I answered the phone, and this voice at the end saying, is that nice? I went, yeah. He said, uh, I believe you want to come and sign for me. And I went, yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking, which players try to take the mickey here? Because that's what footballers do, a bit of banter. And uh, I said, yeah, I'd love to. He said, good. See you tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Don't be late. And put the phone down. So that was my introduction to Brian Clough. Um, so I didn't turn up for the second day at Manchester United. Didn't even well, I didn't even acknowledge them. Didn't ring them up or anything. And um, I don't think they were waiting for me anyway. But um, uh, I came down the following morning and met Brian Clough, and uh, that was it. Brilliant. You mentioned the greengrocer. Uh, we had a tweet from a guy called Brian Flanagan, who has found an old cutting from the Irish Star Sport, the Irish Daily Star, where. Absolutely right. It, he says he signs you on recommendation of his greengrocer. The headline is Clough's Blind Cheek. And this reads by Dave Armitage. Brian Clough left Alex Ferguson fuming again yesterday by paying a quarter of a million for a player he hasn't even seen. Clough had the Manchester United boss seething after snapping up Preston's teenage striker Nigel Jemson. And amazingly, the Forest boss swooped after taking the advice of his local greengrocer who had seen Jemson in action. <laughs> Bizarre, isn't it? That's incredible. Did you ever get to meet the greengrocer? Yeah. I no think, way! I did. I think, obviously, the day I signed or just after that, I had a picture taken up in the stand <laughs> with a, a bowl of fruit or something like that. It was ridiculous. But, uh, what is happening? I didn't. Is this true? Mate, honestly, look, it was in the paper. Why would a tabloid He sent lie? the greengrocer. Yeah. Oh, well, obviously, I think his greengrocer was a, a, a Forest supporter or a Mansfield supporter. Oh, that's better. He, went to, he, went to, he, went, he obviously went to the game. I can remember the game and uh, did okay. And um, that was it. So, um, ten matches United down to come and uh, sign for the gaffer. And there's a great quote in the in that cut that says, "I didn't dismiss United lightly, but I always maintained if I had the chance to join Mr. Clough, I would take it." Uh, a lot of people, you, you, Clough was notorious for when players signed contracts, either having a squash racket behind Trevor Francis's head or or <laughs> various stunts. When you signed on the dotted line for Nottingham Forest, was there any tomfoolery from Clough? Well, it's quite bizarre. Because obviously I got down and um, always wanted to, you know, you saw him on TV and, you know, his green jumper and, you know, made you laugh and he excited me. That was it. Brian Clough, got a sign for him. And uh, so I get down there in the morning. My mum and dad went down. My manager at the time, John McGrath, bless him, who's passed away, he went down and he's driver. So we all get down there. So we, we go into the uh, into the club and uh, obviously said hello and got to, got to know each other. And then uh, the gaffer turned around to Carol at the time and says, take his mum and dad, gave him some money to the lace market and you know, get some presents. <laughs> so that was that. So my mum and dad went out of the way. And then I had to walk his dog, <laughs> Del, down the Trent. I've never seen the Trent before in my life. And I'm walking down the Trent while John McGrath and the gaffer did my contract. So I got back and went, here's your contract, sign this. And that was it. So you're taking his dog for a walk. Did they say, make sure you're gone for an hour or half an hour or...? No, I just think... Just take it for a walk. I don't... I don't by this, what our contract got, I don't think he took an hour to sort my contract out. <laughs> <laughs> they could have done it in five minutes. Because you used to walk his dog, didn't you, Paul? Religiously, yeah. Yeah. Don't bring him back until he's done his business. That's what I used to get. <laughs> he's a lovely dog, though, wasn't he? He's a lovely dog, really nice, yeah. The Golden Retriever, was it? A sort yeah. of Labrador type thing. Golden Retriever? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I just I bought one myself after it. It was lovely. Inspired by yeah. Dell. Yeah. What did you call it? Henry. Don't I've... laugh. <laughs> it's a nice. It's a nice. It's name close for to my heart. But... Is. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there is a very famous forest dog doing the rounds at the moment. Gunner, who is Eric Lehigh's dog, who uh, his wife let him have after scoring two goals against Arsenal. That was brilliant, though, wasn't it? We don't really deal with the contemporary, but that Arsenal game was incredible, wasn't it? Did you watch it? Yeah, I was. Uh, I was there uh, working. Um, 
But yeah, you could see it. I mean, the second every second goal, you know, where he chest it down and volleyed in the top corner. You could, I was right about. You could see it coming. You know, it was an unbelievable goal. But a great performance, great victory. Um, you know, people say, well, it wasn't their proper first team, etc. But you, you have to beat what's in front of you, and uh, you know, to get that result was was great feeling for the fans. It was bonkers. I was in the A block, and I haven't felt the Forest ground like that for years. It was like it felt nostalgic actually. Beating Arsenal comfortably, they weren't even in the game. It did. Reminds me of the period that I grew up in, going to watch Forest in the in the side that you played in, comfortably beating big teams. It made me want to put my boots on again because Mertzacker was that slow that it made me look like Carl Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first, Jemson. It, it was free a free signing in the wind. The windows open. He's a World Cup winner as well, hasn't he? Can't believe I'm saying it. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. So what were you doing working down there? I do the hospitality in corporate. You know, oh, work on match days um, when the short. I love it. You know, I love being involved at the football club. Um, you know, helping out whenever I can. Um, you know, it's a club obviously close to my heart, and it's someone that I've, you know, hopefully, I'll be able to work full time for in the future. I said, it was that day especially was just so exciting. There was a real air of nostalgia about it. I'm not sure if that's just me. There is a good feeling around the place at the moment. There is a genuine positivity about. It. I tell you what's incredible. Just think about that story of you, you contract and walking the dog. No agent there. No oh, agent. No. Pardon me. I think that was a slight. Are was you that right? audible? Do you need me to rub your belly? Was it, <laughs> Would you like a Rennie? Was that, it's just what, an internal what, what, wipe. What, what, was that an earthquake? Was that, <laughs> <laughs> what what scale was that on? It was. Um, what did you have for your breakfast? I had a New Yorker sandwich. It's, it's too much. It's bacon, turkey, cheese, lettuce, tomato. And you wonder why you look oh. like that. <laughs> Mate, come on! I don't look that bad, do I? No, I'm deflecting. I'll tell you what, if I, if I, if I, with posture, I just got a bit of a belly. I know, it's hard. You know, when you get older, it's the hardest thing to do is to lose weight. I'm 35. Really? That <laughs> young? <laughs> you make me feel great. I'm 48 and I feel fantastic now. You look amazing. You're Thank always, you. You're always, even as a young lad, I know this, this doesn't sound too weird, one of the better looking Forest players. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I was, in, I was in the pub the other night with uh, Greg, who, who runs Inc. Yes. You know, um, does all the sponsorship. And um, I told him that Gemma was going to be on this show because he was telling me that he really likes the show and that. And uh, first words out of his mouth was, is he still dead good looking? <laughs> and did you say no? <laughs> <laughs> I said, when I said he was on this week, somebody went to me, well, one for the ladies then. Be yeah. careful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I remember at school, at primary school, all the girls fancied you. I love the panini stickers. I used to give people stick about panini stickers. I used to collect them, didn't you? And I had pictures on the wall, something, but I was just exaggerating, really. You had lovely blonde hair back then. I used to have them street. I used really? to put a plastic cap on and you used to pull it through your hair. It's like, Mackle, no, he probably had it on as well. <laughs> I have, well, I did bleach my hair about four years ago, but I, my hair is natural colour, Matthew, I promise you. So in the 90s when it was blonde, that was your natural colour? Na- yeah. All of it? All of it. Really? Mm-hmm. Even like the Leon? Yeah, all that, all that natural, promise you. Cause it was really, really bright blonde. Yeah, I was, I was white blonde as a kid. This is thrilling, thrilling, about four times a year. Yeah. <laughs> sort of Boris Johnson. Your hair looks a bit more... You've got the style of Boris now, but not the colour. How dare you. you got the body of him. <laughs> Mix me and you, we can be the new Boris Johnson. <laughs> this is the man with received hairline here, look. <laughs> oh We've got another email here from Scott uh, Ely. He says, During a warm-up against Notts County in the First Division back in August 1991, Forest won 4-0... I remember as an impressionable 13-year-old watching Nigel hit 50-yard balls, not 50-year-old balls. (laughs) (laughs) We're back to the tea bags again. I could get locked up out of here. (laughs) Hit 50-yard balls into the Knots fans in the home stand. Not only was he launching the missiles into the crowd, but as he watched the balls hit their targets, he turned to pretend he was warming up and that it couldn't have been him as the culprit. True story. Ask him, he says. (laughs) I always used to love... Obviously, warps and smashing balls all over the place and things like that. But the the one thing that stuck out my that game was we're four 0 up, and I got substituted for passing the ball back from the halfway line. <laughs> <laughs> Always sticks out of my head. You know, I think oh, just kill the game off. You know, don't let him score. And, and, and Cluffy took me off. He said, "You don't do that with me." He took it, me off. Who did he bring on? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Do Probably Lee Glover. <laughs> oh, we'll come to that. Uh, we'll come yeah, to yeah. that. <laughs> well, can't wait for that. I'm not bitter. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I'm bitter about it, and I was a kid. But um, is that true though? Would you occasionally knock balls into the crowd on purpose? Yeah, I did. I did it to, uh, to Norwich once. <laughs> 
Was it? Would you deliberately aim at people that were giving you abuse, or was it just a bit of fun? Well, no, no, it's just a bit of fun. I, I, I loved a bit of banter. That, that was me, you know, messing around with the fans and get them on your side or get them on the opposite side, really, which inspired me more. I mean, the bigger the game, the better I felt. Would you ever give any? Would you ever give any back verbally during games? No, not really. Just as like I say, it was just friendly banter between you and the away supporters or whatever, and um, I loved it. Yeah, it was great. I miss it. It was such a because the banter seems to have gone a bit now. Football stadium is a bit more sterile. Well, it's serious, isn't it? I mean, obviously with Sky TV, they show everything and anything, something. So you've got to be very careful now what you do and what you say because there's about three million cameras all over the place. And players um, walking around with a hand over their mouths. Yeah, what's all that about? Uh, yeah. So they can't be lip read. <clears throat> what are they the saying though? That's that that shouldn't be lip read. It's too big, Max, and I. <laughs> fillet of fish. Get, uh, did you have a McDonald's black card, by the way? Just something. You, you're joking about this now. When we played in the 91 FA Cup final, well, no, sorry, when we got to the FA Cup final, not when we played, because <laughs> I, I didn't you play. The there, yeah. um, I had to do um, uh, something for, I think it was presented to check at McDonald's down at um, Castle Marina, yeah. and they gave me a card that I could use every day, but up to a fiver. So you wonder why I was overweight. Still using it? Obviously not now, no. <laughs> I think I found it. <laughs> yeah, but it's not 55 quid. Wow. No, I, 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 yeah, but I mean, you use it so often, you get a bit sick of it, don't you? So, I know, but what a thing to have. It was great. What other yeah. the perks did you get? Um, I can't remember that too much, honest. I mean, football gear, you used to get a lot of football gear. I used to uh, be sponsored by Dear Door, and I used to get shed loads of stuff like that, but... Uh, did you get a motor? Yes, I did. I did, yeah. My first car was a Ford Escort. Nice. Um, and then I changed it to an MG Mini Metro, I think it was. And then I signed a, a, a new contract at Forest and I got a BMW and I thought I was a dog's bees. Honestly. Yeah. I used to drive around in this red BMW and my number plate was H10 Gem. <laughs> Amazing. And, Amazing. And it used to go on the, uh, you know, the fan zone thing, the the, the brochure they used to do, take the mickey out of all the players I was on there on, on the on front page there in this car with my tracksuit on arm out the window <laughs> with a car phone it, it, honestly it was hilarious oh, but uh, I used to love it it love must it. have been the temptation to just really revel in it all and just you know get beamers and slightly go mad and obviously it's very different the, the sheer amount of money that young players are earning now is, is off the scale there's a, a, always a level of moral outrage about it but you're earning good money at a young age there relative to, to people who aren't playing football how hard is it to keep your feet on the ground? Well you look at it and we're talking about I was I got this red BMW at the 318 IS I think it was when I was 1920. now then they can they can buy three a week now with the money mm. they're getting. You know, they, I think money's thrown at young players too quickly now. Uh, there's not no incentives and no hunger to um, progress. Um, but that's the way it is, unfortunately, with footballers now. Isn't it? There know, was a real, there was a real fear with Clough, though, wasn't there? Like and, and, and Archie and, and Liam, that if and Ronnie Fenton and, and Alan yeah. Hill and all the others. Yeah, there was a little bit of a culture of fear that if you did anything flash or you know you stepped out of line, you got put straight back in your place, didn't you? Especially being a youngster, yeah. And yeah. obviously that's why Cluffy always used to call me Big Head. You know, I've got a bigger head than him because I was this confident person that, you know, I did have success at a young age. But he did try and he tried everything to try and keep your feet on the ground. And there was that fear with him, wasn't there? Something, yeah. you know, you stepped out of line and you knew it. It was just a good feeling, wasn't it, around yeah. there? Yeah. You know, you, if you were injured and you were limping, you make sure that the gaffer didn't see you because he'd, he'd go mad at you. Or <laughs> for being injured. <laughs> well, you're no good to me, something. But uh, you know, you, the game has changed so much. I, mean, I can remember going to Sweden on a pre-season trip, and um, we we're playing a game, and obviously I was on the subs bench. <laughs> Seems quite familiar that. But um, <laughs> there was about five hours there watching the game, and then we looked around. There's this hot dog stand. You know, just around the corner, and uh, Cluffy turned around to me. He says, "Do you want a hot dog?" I was thinking, "What's he on about?" I'm playing a game here, and uh, he gave me some <laughs> money to get the lads a hot dog. So we were watching a game pre-season, eating a hot dog, you know, in the dugout, and uh, one of the lads goes down injured, and obviously he had to come off, and he won't put any of us on because we get indigestion. <laughs> And this is pre-season. <laughs> Priceless. Amazing. I used to love a part of the... a hot dog. Yeah, you were I love say. a hot dog. And that that that's not a surprise, Gemma. That's <laughs> what was it? A ten footer. 
There's one season on Trent Bridge. And that guy, do you remember the guy? I don't know how much as a player you notice what's going on in the crowd, but there used to be a bloke who had like a mobile stall down at the front of the main stand. So not pitch side of the wall, the other side in that sort of ditch in between the, dog the, out, the perimeter wall, yeah, and the thing. And it was like a mobile trolley and it, it would sell like Bovril and hot chocolate and grab bag sized crisps. Yeah. And I he remember. had like paper boys gloves on. I used to spend a fortune on a case <laughs> hot <laughs> chocolates and bovrils. Well, to be fair, he only served you and then went home. He made his money. <laughs> it's my personal <laughs> concierge service. Uh, we've had a number of people. We, we found out in the last episode, actually, lots of people around the world listen to this. People in New York and Thailand and all over. We had a message on Twitter from the Toronto Trickies. Oh, come on. Supporters group in Toronto. Do you remember ex-Forest uh, player Jim Brennan? Yeah. yeah. Played Forest in the noughties. He's out there now and regularly meets up with them. We had a message from a guy, Steve Ball, who's a, who's a big in the Toronto Trickies. Says, if we want to do a show in New York, we can double it up with a trip to Toronto. Come on, it's on, right? It's on. All expenses paid. Well, that's that's the that, that currently is the... <laughs> <laughs> Johnny, that's currently the problem. Well, you've got a big new TV show happening soon, aren't you? You're going to be as famous as Elvis and... I can't bankroll all this, though. Of course you can. Come on, it's just numbers. We could do it as a holiday. Mm. What? No, I need... You've with me, but you won't go on holiday with me. We'd have a great holiday. We would have a good holiday, Got there in we? a forest kit. Oh, stop it. Shin pads. Oh, shin pads and that. <laughs> It'd take you ages to rub oil on your back. <laughs> 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 I'm not as fat. I just no, make... you're really not. I think no, you should qualify that. No. Just a bit, what, 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 you're thin fat, aren't you? You're thin fat. There's a bit of you're chunky. Yeah, <laughs> in the nicest, in a yeah, nice way. Yeah, yeah. Cud- <laughs> cuddly. I mean, talking of holidays, did you ever go to Calamillo? Oh, Calamillo, yeah, loads of times. It was a fantastic place that was. We took over the place, <laughs> but we went actually after the cup final when I scored, and uh, it was on. I can just remember saying, that's me. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, but uh, no, it was a great, great place to go for a few days, uh, pre-season training and stuff like that, in the bar and on the beach. So what was it? Was it a, was it like a villa that he owned or was it just a resort that he visited, Clough? He got, I think he got one. I'm not sure whether Ronnie Fenton's got one. So someone else had one. So obviously it was a regular jaunt to go over there. Um, but we stopped in a hotel, so yeah, we, we didn't go anywhere near his apartment. The whole squad? Yeah, the whole squad. They used to go, you know, he used to... Tell us on a Wednesday, Thursday, saying, "Oh, by the way, we're going away. Pack your bags on Saturday after the after the game." And that was it till Wednesday, Thursday. What a treat! Oh, I, went, I went once, and I, uh, Steve Blatherwick saved my life. <laughs> Sounds like a Mills and Boom. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <clears throat> we were we were in a bar, and some some lad just took a disliking to me. I've got that kind of face, and back then, you know, I had the hair and all that kind of stuff. And some yeah. lad just wanted to beat beat me to death. Obviously, my best friend Mark Crossley. You know, the only time we've ever had an argument was over there. And we got friendly with these two brothers, twins, I think they were, uh, that play music. And. The Gallaghers? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Not Kirsty. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Norm and I used to like flick a coin to see if it was Ed Tails. If you won it, you'd like pay for the drinks or you'd do this. It was crazy. Sometimes we'd go on a, on a, on a Friday afternoon into town and we'd toss a coin to see. Who'd buy each other a pair of jeans that's how mad it was so we went over there and we, and we got the, it, they did these CDs for us with the, all the best music on and uh, obviously I won the toss no matter by the, the CDs and everything and then he lost them and I went mad at him so I can't believe you lost these CDs He's got the best music ever and we had a, our first fallout there but uh, it was great over there I and mean, we, we played like follow my leader Norm used to start it off and we were up and down cars and we were, we were doing all sorts. You've got to do what I do, otherwise you're in trouble. So what songs were on that CD? Do you remember? Oh, I, I cannot remember. So what, what era to us? Sort of 18, 9, 9? This was, remember? yeah. Spandau, bit of Spandau Ballet on there. Simple Minds. Oh, cool lovely on. talking heads. Yeah. Oh, maybe a bit of late Johnny Cash knocking oh, around. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Nurse. So, so how bad was the argument? Was, was it, I wouldn't want to get in an argument with Crossley. I mean, he's a tall, broad heavy lad isn't he yeah no <laughs> but you made up fairly quick oh yeah of course we were yeah he was probably making me a cup of tea in the morning and you still talk now oh yeah of course we were, yeah I mean he's got parents to both my boys and I got parents to his boys and uh, although we don't see as much as I'd like to now because obviously life changes and work and he's at Notts County travelling up and down um, yeah he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a great lad that's lovely to know that people still keep in touch are you still in I'm touch I'm good at that that's good. I like to keep in touch with people. I'm, I have my phone all over the place, so 
I get frustrated at times when you text people and ring people, they don't answer straight away. Yeah, I'm like that. You know, because I do it and I expect everyone else to. So when yeah. they, you, know, you text someone and they don't get back for two days, well, it's too late now, I don't want to know. <laughs> I'm exactly the same. Yeah, me too. If I go <clears throat> from my lounge to the kitchen, I'll take my phone with me. Yes, so do I. I won't put it down. I take it to every room in the house. Yeah, I do as well. Yeah, yeah. So isn't it fun when and, you, when you, you know, your wife, you know, takes her phone out and you're calling her and calling her and calling her. And she just doesn't answer. Oh, have you got it on silent? Yeah, okay, I'm dying. Oh, here. gosh. <laughs> Why have your phone? I Why know, have it? I, I know someone exactly the same and it drives me potty. Now, we do a regular feature called Number One is Brian Rice where we go through uh, retro, <laughs> retro forest chants. The it's bear. Time, time for this episode. It's number One is Brian Rice. And number two. Now, this is an email from Lee James. It says, Gemma was the subject of the first forest chant my dad taught me. I must have been about six years old and it's stuck with me ever since. You fat... No. <laughs> <laughs> now, this... Uh, now, we should... I'm going to actually read the end of the email before doing the chant. It says, At the time of learning this chant, I was also attending Sunday school where the tune of this chant was sung regularly. You can imagine me changing the words to the Gemma version. <laughs> Didn't go down too well. So this is, a, this is a hymn that had been reworked. I don't know if you remember this. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Number 10 on his back, many goals he has scored. His name is Nigel Jensen. He's the finest in the land and the Reds go marching on, on, on. Never heard that before. I've, you... never, I've not heard that, no. Well, yeah, I like it. I love it. It's yeah. great, isn't it? I love it. It's really quite... Catchy. Powerful, yeah, yeah. yeah. But imagine him at his Sunday school changing it to the Jensen. Jensen oh. words while he was at Sunday school. I must have done something right after all. Yeah, do you remember any chants about yourself? One at Sheffield, well, apart from the usual fat sort of thing, people, but <laughs> Sheffield Wednesday had the worst one ever. We've got Nigel Jemson, he smokes 20 Benson. <laughs> <laughs> What's all that about? It's great. It's rubbish. I think it's really funny. It rhymes. We've got what? Nigel oh, Jemson. Is that all that has to happen? Benson. <laughs> da, 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 da. That was, yeah. yeah but that's good. Stevie Stone got no air and all stuff like that. Um, got no air, did you? Okay. No, I didn't. I, I'm not. not so it wasn't factually correct, so no, they need to check themselves. Not into facts. <laughs> was it 20 Marlboros? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you're most famous for the 1990 League Cup final, scoring that great goal against Oldham, which wouldn't Forest the Cup, retained Forest the Cup. Was that the last major trophy we've won? It was, yeah. And I mean, it, it was the major. It's not the la- We won the ZDS in 92. But yes, yeah, so it's the last, <laughs> so it's the last <laughs> major trophy we've won. Scoring the winning goal at a major final in Wembley. How much of that day do you still remember? Everything. It's as if it was yesterday. It was immense. Just to play at Wembley, I mean, oh God, you know, when you when you were a kid at nine or ten, you used to watch it was FA Cup final day, wasn't it? Or an FA Cup final day. You watched it from nine o'clock in the morning till five o'clock at night because you watched the build up on in the hotel and the drive on the coach down Wembley Way. You know, people turning up in, in the suits, walking on the pitch, looking around. You watched everything. You were glued to it. Yeah. And uh, and that was the reason why you wanted to be footballers. It wasn't the case of how many houses you got or whether I was driving a Bentley. As much as I'd love to drive a Bentley, I'm not. Um, that's what it was all about. Cut finals. Paul Smith suits, I think, did. Paul forget. Smith? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that's like... Proper that's, treated. That's high fashion. What's so funny about that? Uh, that is high fashion. It's not like I'm saying, wow, but like George from Asda. Like this. Oh, God. You've done me there, mate. But that's that is brilliant. like... Did you wow, <laughs> Paul Smith. Yeah. Yeah. Even now. We had, and it, oh, we had our little cup and it had emblemed in, the, in your suit. Oh, did you ever get a Paul Smith suit? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, most years. Wouldn't it be amazing to have a Paul Smith kit? Why has that never happened? It cost a fortune. It cost a fortune. It would fit yours anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Stop breathing in. Too big one. But actually, the vertical lines are slimming, so a Paul Smith suit would suit me perfectly. Well, this is just a plain navy blue, I think it was. But uh, walking out, you know, that that long stretch, I mean, that's something now that the new Wembley, I think, misses out on. You know, that walk from the, the tunnel area. The halfway line was fantastic. You're looking around and you're seeing all that. I see my parents, I knew exactly where they were. I had to see my mum and dad before the game started to make sure they were there and yeah. you know, got super, very superstitious. Um, it wasn't a, a typical Forest goal, really. You know, it started from a, a goal kick and I flicked it on to, to Nigel and he reversed it back. And with my blistering pace, past Dale Barrett, who was quick <laughs> at the time, and I left him for dead. Um, yeah, I managed to uh, 
First five well, up there, Gemma. Yeah, correct. <laughs> I managed to uh, miss the first shot. We but, keep uh, getting sick. Keep going. Made, made a fantastic save. Something. I don't know how he saved it. <laughs> <laughs> and then with it being straight at him, with it <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Yeah, you get a second go. I've got it. a second go, and, and obviously put it into an empty net, and then like just a sea of red in front of me. It, you know, you're, you know, the fans that you know idolise you in a way. Yeah. And for me to score that, and you know, just turning to them, oh. Even now, I feel the goose pimples. You know, it was it was fantastic, and obviously watching it back afterwards, Clovin didn't even move. <laughs> you know, just didn't show any emotion at all. And it was um, really early on in the game, wasn't it? Pardon? No, it was about the forty seventh minute, I think. Forty eighth minute, <laughs> you think? Yeah, yeah. I know exactly when it was. It was just straight after half time. Best goal you ever scored? Well, I wouldn't say the best goal, but the you know the most that it meant to me. Um, you know, I was, I'd say scoring a Wembley winner. It was, Dreams, isn't it? You know, it's um... well. That's it. I mean, you're in an elite group of people anyway. To have been a professional footballer and to have played for Forest, to have played in a Wembley final, and on top of that, scored the winning and only goal in a in a, in a major final. Well, that's that's the history. The, that's the thing for me. Isn't it? The only goal. So, unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you look at it, people always remember me for that uh, for that goal. Oh, that's that, fortunate. That goal final. It's, that's better uh, than never doing it. Oh, it's mega. It's brilliant. And uh, you know, we we played the game. <laughs> Straight on the coach, straight back to Nottingham, and then everyone just disappeared. What? We didn't have no party afterwards. Are you kidding like, me? No. I th- no, I think I went back home and watched it on Match of the Day or something stupid like that. And then he actually got us in training the next morning and ran us. No. And we got a bonus, obviously, for winning the cup. And you know, we're, we're training, and Des Walker's going, You can run me as much as you want. I've got X amount of money now in the bank. <laughs> and he made him say, Right, we're doing more. <laughs> well, Des shut up. Yeah. But that's, yeah. But there was no... Did you drink on the coach on the way back? No. What on earth is going on? But the year after, obviously, after the FA Cup yeah. final, we had a civic reception when we lost. So that's it. So actually, when you won in 1990, there was no open top bus tour, there was no... No. Official not that, not marking that, of... Not that I can recall. And the club didn't... You didn't say, should we go out next week and just celebrate the fact we've just won the League Cup? Not now. There was none, nothing no, at all. No, not even, no, 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 not even sausage rolls. Well, did you have some? <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe there weren't even like nibbles laid on volivants. Well, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I mean in blankets. Yeah. I mean, we might have had something on the coach on the way back. We might have stopped off at the service station or something. But no, so, no, it was um, yeah, no, nothing special at all. And it's like, I can't believe he ran you the next day. He ran us. That he, is shocking. Down, we had to walk down, obviously, down to train ground, down the Trent, and, and ran us. But well, that was him, wasn't it? That was him all over. I've seen the Littlewoods Cups. They're, they're in the trophy room at Forest. And I think they're the originals because it was a different trophy, wasn't it? To the to the League Cup with the three handles. The Littlewoods trophy yeah. was a sort of bespoke. Single, didn't have any handles. We all got um, an individual one for winning it. Yes, and there's little... Cause Steve Chet was telling us and there's little green boxes. It was in a green box the... with a Littlewoods Cup on it and everything, yeah. Have you still got yours? Yeah, it's, uh, it's the best thing, I've, uh, best thing I've got. What else have you got from your playing days? Um, what else we've got there? Um, obviously, I've got a runners up medal in the FA Cup final mm-hmm. the year after. But have you kept your shirt? Have you kept your shirt from the final? We've got two shirts for the Little Cup final. I've got a short sleeve and a long sleeve. Um, my long sleeve, my mum's got. Uh, and short sleeve, obviously, I've got I've got that framed. I've got uh, Brilliant. my England shirt that I made my debut at Tranmere against Wales, playing up front with Alan Shearer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got that and uh, my Sheffield Wednesday shirt, you know, obviously, when we in the Premier League they're the three major Brilliant. shirts that I've kept uh, and obviously my England cap you're happy now aren't you I'm so pleased someone's framed a shirt there's so many people who just say oh, I've, I either haven't got them I don't know where they are or they're just in a bag in the loft no it's um, pride and joy that is for me you know, it's something that obviously my two boys will, will get when I've gone That that's my pride and joy <laughs> <sighs> I mean how much would you take for it <laughs> I wouldn't that, that's the thing the about it well actually make an offer <laughs> <laughs> So the 91, I mean, it's so sad having to ask, and I, I feel awkward having to ask you about it, but you might have seen when we announced that you came on, a few people on Twitter said you've got to ask him about 91, as well as all the people that asked about 1990. That cup final, obviously, is so bittersweet for people. They remember Psycho's goal, they remember the fact that Gaza should have been sent off, they gutted for Des Walker, it was a final we could have won, and our star striker, who could have made all the difference, doesn't play. Instead, <clears throat> with the greatest respect to Lee Glover, he plays, and I think a lot of people feel that it should have been you. And I think, arguably, one of Cluffy's biggest mistakes. How did it feel? Did you Firstly, did you think you were going to play in the final? I got told I was going to be playing in the final by <gasps> Ronnie Fenton. 
Uh, oh, so how close during to the, the week? Was that? Oh, during the week. Oh, no. Um, but if you look back and you look at back at how the gaffer worked, I didn't play in the semi-final. I was subbed that day. And invariably, he always kept his, his team that had got him there. And it was actually Stuart Pearce who, who read the team out and uh, said, obviously, there's going to be some people who aren't going to be happy. Uh, Lawsy, your sub because he's playing Charlesy. Oji, your sub because he's playing Roy Keane. And Gemma, you're not included because obviously at the time there's only two subs. You know, obviously Lee Glover's playing, and it was horrendous. Obviously, I was I was upset. I was crying on the on the on the coach. Um, and we got back to the hotel, and obviously all the media was there, and press. And he saw me crying, and he, he as I got off the bus, he went, "Son, come have a photograph with me." So I'm, we're on the back page. I think it was a mirror at the time. You know, I'm I'm crying. And he's laughing his head off, <laughs> or smiling, <laughs> as it as he would. Obviously, going to Wembley, parking the bus up. I can remember crying and uh, you know, the supporters are going past me saying, go on, Gemma, I'll get the winner again this year. And I was like, they had got no, no idea that I wasn't playing, you know, and um, obviously, you know, the rest is history. But um, it, it was awful. It was it was a worst moment of my career. Did he ever explain it to you, Cluffy? Did he ever say, look, I did it because of this? Well, it's funny because he didn't, no. Um, but every time we went to um, an after dinner where he was speaking or whatever, do you know when you sat around the table of eight and there was always um, cards on there saying, you know, write down questions you want to ask the gaffer. So obviously I'm on the table with lots of people and I've always <laughs> said, put that down, why didn't he play Jemson in the cup final? <laughs> and he actually read it out and the only answer he gave is was, because I could. And that was it. He never gave me a straightforward answer why he didn't play me. He just, you know, why did you leave Jemson out? Because I could. And that was it. But, I mean, again, supporters, it's all about opinions. Whether would we have won if I had been playing? Who knows? Never, no one will know. But I still think, and I think majority of Nottingham Forest supporters would have yes. said, if Brian Laws, Steve Hodge, Nadia Jemson would have played in that cup final, we'd have won it. The thing is, as well, quite apart from anything else, the Southampton game, which helps us get the, the quarter fifth, final. Fifth round. Yeah. You know, where you score a hat-trick... Where Forest were just absolute people who were there say so it was one of the best Forest performances they'd ever seen. Everyone was on fire. So that great goal where Pierce goes galloping down the left wing, cuts it in for you, and you stick it in the that, top that, corner. That was my third goal. Rampant. Yeah, I think I took a penalty as well. I think, if I remember right, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, where I really I shouldn't have done it. it. Should have been Nigel's, and I just grabbed the ball. You know, being confident I was, and I think it was just before half time. I thought, if I miss this, that's it, I'm not coming out for the second <laughs> half. But I, I stuck it away, luckily, and then we played Norwich, I think, in the quarter-final. Uh, we that's won, right, Roy Keane scores. And I set, I set Roy's up, we won 1-0, I think. Well, actually, it's funny, because Roy Keane, for doing a forward roll, I think, took a clump from Cluffy uh, for that. He well, said, if he wants a job in a circus, <laughs> if he wants to be a clown, I'll get him a job in a circus, and I think, um, give him one in the guts. Cluffy whacked you one apparently is that right yeah, after a game did, at yeah. Derby yeah well it was a reserve game yeah one of his pet hates was, and you'll know Mac was if, as, a, as a winger or a forward player and you put a cross in and it went behind the goal he used to go mad and, or it uh, hit the first yeah first the defender. first defender yeah. I tell people we're sat in a pub watching a game a winger will put a cross in or a corner and yeah. it's the first defender I, I always sit there going I'd have been dragged off for that I'd have been <laughs> taken <laughs> off the park for but, not missing that first defender but you you realise now how annoying it is yeah, it's dreadful yeah I hate it we came on I think we were losing 1-0 at the time in the reserve game and obviously uh, Derby wanted to win the game and we got back to 1-1 and then last couple of minutes I put this crossing behind the goal I thought oh god I'm going to get it now he always used to have a tennis ball or a cricket ball and he used to just like throw it to people. You had to catch it and you had to amuse him and chuck it back to him and stuff like that. He got this cricket ball, I think, and I knew I was in for it when he, the venom, they threw it <laughs> at me and I caught it. And then obviously I, I gently threw it back to him. And then he just said, son, stand up. So I stood up and he walked over and he went, son, have you ever been hit before? I went, no, boss. And then he just whacked me in the stomach. He said, well, you have now. You're a disgrace. <laughs> Your mum and dad should be ashamed of you. Oh my god! Um, and that was that. But the next morning, we used to go to a cafe just around the corner from the ground called Mackay's, and we always used to go there for our muesli and stuff. <laughs> 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 okay, the bacon legs and everything. And um, I got approached by the Mirror. Uh, a fellow came in there. I mean, this is the morning afterwards, and um, it'd been leaked out. And I know who did it. It was one of our players at the time. He offered me ten grand to do a story on it. And I just said, no, not true, not true. And I quickly drove back to the ground 
and knocked on the gaffer's door and uh, said, look, obviously I've just been approached by the mirror to you know, an interview on what happened last night. He said, what did you say? I said, nothing. They went, well done, son, and just left me. That was it. Give you a left up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Hit me properly this time. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so 10 grand back then, how, how was that as a proportion of your well, was, was Massive, wasn't it? You know, I was probably on about £600 a week then. So um, it was a big, I mean, it would be a big amount now to turn down. But it was really it would, yeah. life-changing back then. But... It would have been life changing if I'd have done it because if I'd have sold that story, then my career at Forest would have been finished. And uh, but it, you know, like I say, I would never, you know, whatever good or bad, you you know, you won't go back to the paper about Brian Clough anyway. But when so when you tell your mum Brian Clough's just punched you in the stomach, did she say I'm going to have to have a word with him, Nigel? That's just not on, or was it just accepted that? This I think she probably said you deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what my mum would have said as well. Uh, we do a regular feature on it called Trick or Tree, which is a, a sort of true or false. A story about a, a a story from forest history that could be trick, false, or tree true. We'll put it out on Twitter after the show, and you'll find out in a fortnight about this story. So I'll, I'll put it to you, fellas. Um, you have to decide whether this is trick or tree. Have you read the result of the last one yet? I can't remember the last one. So trick is <laughs> false. Yeah, and tree is true. Would you like me to right. read it out for you? Can I just say true or false, then you turn it around? Okay, yeah, I'm the same. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a bit tenuous. But it gives it a forest thing. Oh, tenuous is the best, right? Anyway, here we go. Okay. So, is this true? It's, uh, it's about a cat. We're all familiar with Pickles the dog, the patriotic mutt who found the Jules Romay trophy under a park bench and saved the pride of a nation. But did you know that Nottingham Forest owe part of their history to a local cat? Shortly after the 1898 FA Cup final, which we won, beating Derby 3-1, the lid of the trophy went missing. Forrester got the train back from London, the old Cleveland steamer, which took about five hours. Just a bit quicker than getting an East Midlands train on a Sunday. <laughs> the players had got stuck into the mead, and on arrival at Nottingham were so drunk they scattered in different directions. Forest forward Alf Spouncer was the last one seen with the trophy lid, and was apparently so smashed on moonshine he tried to post it into a pillar box because he thought it was a letter to the gas board. However... When trying to post the lid, he trod on a stray cat who bit his toes, forcing him to drop the lid and scarper <laughs> towards the meadows area of the city. The lid was found in the morning after someone heard the cat screeching and texted the RSPCA. I think some of that's true and some of it's not. That has bit his toes. <laughs> a cat. A cat. Cats are mad, aren't they? He's wearing shoes at the time, right? Well, that's not confirmed. It was 1898. <laughs> so that like cat the... didn't get a size 8 up his backside or anything? No. Spouncer's high as a kite, isn't he, on mead and moonshine. You know, he's, he's hallucinating. He thinks the lid of the trophy is a letter to the gas board. He's trying to post it when he's come out of Nottingham Station. It's, it sounds so ridiculous that it has to be false, but I, I'm going to go for tree. <laughs> I'm going I'm going the other way, I think. There's some of it, I believe. There's some of it, I believe. This might be the first one I get wrong. So what are you saying? Trick or tree? I'm saying trick. I'm saying trick, and you're saying tree, Nigel. You, we will find out uh, in a fortnight. <laughs> It's time now for Fan on the Phone. Hey, it's Matt Ford here. I'm, in, I'm with Paul McGregor. You're on the Reservoir Red Dogs podcast. Hello there. Easy, Aid. How you doing, mate? Hello, mate. How you doing? Long time. It has been a long time. Thanks for coming on. Um, no worries. Matt's got some questions for you. Well, firstly, how do you two know each other? Well, I, I was trying to think, actually, when, when we first met um, and how we first met. You might remember better than me. I just remember you coming over to my studio and recording with me, and I was just thinking... Uh, this is a cool looking dude. And then we sort of, and then you sort of, I was like, oh my God, oh, yeah, he's Paul McGregor. And then it all just kind of fell into place. And um, yeah, we swapped stories about music and forest and all sorts of different things and kind of hit it off. So as well as producing Gary Newman, you also produced Paul McGregor. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I did. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think he's trying to tap me up for some more work. as well. <laughs> What was he, he keeps promising to send me some demos, but I've not received. Oh, they're coming, yet. mate! They're coming! <laughs> they're coming! Are they? Yeah. Okay. What was All he right. like? What was he like to work with, Aid? Just cocky, mate. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I'm sat with Gemma here. Come on. <laughs> Look, jo, I mean, Gemma's a legend, mate. But um, you <laughs> Thanks, know, Aid. <laughs> yeah, I was at the League Cup final in uh, 1990, so you know, you know, Paul McGregor wasn't. You know, what can I say? <laughs> no need for that. Jeez. <laughs> so, Aid, Aid, what what got you into supporting Forest? Um, mum and dad really um, f- for as young as I can remember from as young as I can remember I've always been a Forest fan you know they took me I was a junior red and um, and they took me to the European Cup final in 1980 against Madrid oh. when we beat um, Kevin Keegan's Hamburg 
in uh, at the Bernabeu Stadium. That was like an amazing memory. I was playing football as well, played for Forest Juniors. Um, uh, I was sort of intended to be a professional footballer, but um, and then I got dodgy toes. I couldn't I couldn't play anymore. So that was kind of the end of that. But um, just been a Forest sport for forever. And even now I live down south now, I still come back as often as I can to see the games. And what what are your abiding memories of Nigel Jemson? <laughs> the League Cup final. I mean, yeah, Gemma was like the pretty boy of the team, wasn't he? <laughs> really. um, We've covered this ground. <laughs> you didn't get me very far in the orchid, though. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I might have seen you down there a few times what? before I was called. <laughs> before. <laughs> what a caveat. <laughs> I, was a, I was an orchid boy, not a hippo or anything like that. But, you know, being at, being at the... It was, it was the Oldham, it was the Oldham final, wasn't it, that yeah. you were playing in? Uh, Forest against Oldham, there's a glamour tie. Uh, it actually used to be a glamour tie, didn't it? We, won, we beat Luton as well, I think. It was either the year before or the year after the year before. Before. I mean, that's Forest have had two fantastic eras, haven't they? You know, yes. it's the 79 80 yeah. European Cup final wins, never be forgotten, and rightly so. But a lot of people a lot of people don't really talk about the year between 88 and, say, 93, where Wembley was a home fixture, wasn't it? Everyone used to say, oh, Absolutely. Forest back to Wembley again. We, we Because of what we did in 79 and 80, he took a back seat a little, didn't he? But back to back League Cup wins there and six yeah. finals yeah. in four seasons, and yeah. four of those were victories. So why are people not talking about that era as well? I think because uh, my theory on it is that English yeah. clubs were banned from Europe at the time, and because that wouldn't have got us into European games again, right. for some reason, I think it's just not on people's radar. But it's on, I mean, I think for yeah, Forest fans... Yeah, we had a fantastic fans, side, though. I think well, for, Forest for, fans, for, for the younger, massive. For the younger supporters, yeah. you know, that, that must be something that's high on their, that sort of era. It, yeah. It was glorious. I, I, I kind of feel as though I've had two levels of amazing memories of Forest because there was obviously, sort of, even though I was really young, sort of 11, 12, when Forest were winning the League Cup and uh, winning two European Cups, uh, you know, so it sort of blends into one really because you know so many amazing memories from from back then but then when sort of uh Stuart Pearce and and Nigel Clough came along you know we had this like resurgence of you know being at Wembley all the time and it was it was fantastic so you're very you know? fortunate you like you said you've experienced both eras so you, you remember the 79-80 yeah. and, and going to that game and then obviously going to Wembley in yeah. in, in the 89-90-91 year and Let's hope, fingers crossed, that you know we get a third year of the, oh, where, yes. where we could talk yeah. about. Yes, come you know, on. Yeah, Nottingham right. Forest yeah, got to Wembley and win anything again, and um, that would well, not be fantastic. It'd be absolutely amazing. It'd be absolutely amazing. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, it's difficult to kind of um, articulate it properly to, to to younger fans that you know actually for people my age and and older that it's kind of normal to expect those great things yeah. because that's what we're supposed to be. Aid, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Cheers, Aid. Thank Speak you to you, mate. See you later. Well, what an amazing positive note to finish on. Hope of a of a third wave of, of Nottingham Forest glory. Nigel, it's been an honour getting to talk to you today. It means a great deal to me. I know it means a lot to Paul and to the thousands of people who listen to this. It will it will make the start of their year. No, it's been a great to go on and, and talk about my great times at the football club. It's something that gave me my, you know, my, my dreams. Well, you gave us a lot of dreams. You know, that, that cup final lives long in the memory for a lot of people, including mine, and you're a true forest icon, so thank you for coming in. Thank you Cheers, very much. Gemma. Cheers, uh, Appreciate for, it. Cheers, for those of you listening, don't forget to tweet us. We are on Twitter, at RRD1865. Email us any stories that you remember of former forest players or any forest memories you have of being a ball boy or a mascot. Uh, all your first games and your worst games, RRD1865 at Outlook.com. Do subscribe to the podcast. It helps other uh, Forest fans find it and leave us a review on iTunes. Um, a positive one, if possible, you know. Play the game, lads. Come on. Yeah, come on. Uh, so subscribe to this. Tell your friends. Share it online and leave us a review. We'll be back in another fortnight with another episode of Reservoir Red Dogs. But from me, Johnny and Paul, it's goodbye. Goodbye. You reds. <laughs> Have we really finished? We, we tend to end. Are we ever six. really finished? <laughs> <laughs> right, two, three, four. My, My eyes have seen, seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Number, Number ten, ten is black. Many goals he has scored. His name is Nigel Jemson. He's the finest in the land. And the Reds go marching on, on, on. Jemo, 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 Jemo. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs>
super. Well done. Very good.